Hello, my name is Bren Antrim, and I'm one of the librarians here at Santa Monica College. Today we'll be doing an introduction to doing research using the SMC Library Resources. Please make note of these informational items. If you have questions as we go, please use chat to ask them. Throughout the presentation, I will pause and answer those questions, and during that time, I will turn off the recording to maintain your privacy. Please be patient. When you're starting your research, you start off at the library website. This is your first stop on your research journey, where you can search for articles, books, and other resources. You can chat with a librarian. You can use research guides in case you get stuck in your research or you need a starting place. You can discover database tours and workshops on our YouTube channel. You can connect with tutoring. And you can find other resources, such as booking study rooms, the actual steps in the research process in case you're unsure how to continue on, how to print, Wi-Fi, etc. And that looks like this. In order to get to the library homepage, there are a couple of different ways that you can get there. From the menu, you can go to the plus sign next to Student Support, and that will open a drop-down menu, and we're alphabetically underneath Academic Support between Counseling and Online Learning at the library. The other way to do that from the college homepage is just add a slash library, and that will get you there quickly. When you first look at the library homepage, an Ask Us will pop up. This is 24-7, 365 library chat. You can add your question, and if it's during our open hours, an SMC librarian will answer your question. If it's at a time when the library is closed, one of our fellow librarians in the consortium to which we belong, we belong will answer, and if they can't completely answer it, they will contact us to get back with you and further explore your question. Scrolling down the library homepage, we're going to be doing specific searches later on in this presentation, but just to show you where to find things. Many of the things on the left-hand side are also available on these buttons. These are the high-touch areas that people use the most. One search is one way to find things. Um, I don't recommend going here right off the bat if you have a specific search. If you know that you need an ebook, for example, there are databases for that. If you know you need a news article or you specifically need a scholarly journal article, there are databases for that as well. But say you need your math book. You're on campus, you need your math book. You can say, I need my calculus book. In order to find that, you're not just going to necessarily pick the first one that comes up. Sometimes you get lucky. And it will say it is available at the main library in reserves, which means this is a book that belongs to your teacher who has loaned it to us to loan to you for two hours at a time inside the library. You would write this call number down, take it to the main desk, and check it out. If it says it's available at main stacks, that means you can check it out and take it home. And this is usually where you find older editions of textbooks. Say, for example, you want to test out of a chemistry class, and you just need to brush up on organic chemistry. There are older chemistry texts that still have useful information in the stacks that you can take home for two weeks and to study. If you don't find your book right off the bat, you can change this search area from everything and anything to specifically textbooks on reserve research it, and it will bring up many fewer books. Notice now that everything that comes up says it's on reserves, and you don't find those older editions that are in the stacks. If you're looking for a book in print, and you want one that you can take home, you don't necessarily want to study it online, you can say books and videos on library shelves and research it. That gives you many more including both reserves and stacks, many more options for you to choose from. So the three main collections that you will probably use when you search in the library are the first collection, everything in the collection and all of our databases and a whole bunch of stuff from online, textbooks on reserve, and then either 
only ebooks and online access or only books and videos on library shelves. So you choose where you look. Okay. So heading back to the library. The other, <laughs> no thank you, we're good. The other places where you can look, if you have specific databases in mind, if you need to take a look at research guides, if you want to connect with tutoring, if you want to check out some of the videos and workshops like this one on YouTube, or if you need to ask a librarian for help, all of those are quickly available here. In addition, it tells you when we're open, when we're closed, and links to many of our resources, as well as how to contact us and ends with chat with us for help. You can book study rooms here, you can find out about printing here, and you can find out about Wi-Fi here. Ignore these things. This is just for faculty, not for students. Okay. Heading back into specific research, where do you find information? When you go looking, people tend to head immediately to Google or Wikipedia. The only problem really with either of these is information overload. There are some very good things to be found this way, but it's kind of buried in the load of junk that you have to get through. And most of the time when you're doing research, there are two problems. One, you don't have a lot of time. You have a deadline you have to meet. You have things that you have to turn in by specific times. The other thing is you're usually researching something you don't know very much about. So it can take you a lot of time to do evaluation when you get a lot of information thrown at you and determine, is this useful? Is it on topic? Do I trust it? So in order to make that easier, it is more effective and more efficient to do your research specifically in a targeted way. The catalog, the one that I just quickly showed you, gives you books. Books give you background, context, they assume you don't know anything about your topic. So even if you do know something about your topic, sometimes you don't know what you don't know. And those holes in your information can really have a bad impact on your research. So going into the books first to get that solid foundation gives you enough background to where you can more easily determine whether the articles you find are actually useful and helpful and good or not. It also gives you some information about what words scholars in those areas use to describe their research. So that helps narrow down and make more specific your search terms. Once you have that solid foundation, then you head into the databases to find articles and other specific research that really narrows in on your topic and gives you depth. Books give you breadth. Database articles give you depth. It, it really drills down into your topic. And this is why you don't necessarily want to start with articles, because if you start with really narrow articles, you might miss the bigger picture. And again, that can have a very bad effect on your research. And finally, you head into the web to find that information that you can't find in the books and in the articles. Um, really current information, for example. The main thing that you need to do with websites is evaluate the information that you find. And this can be a little difficult because websites often exist to sell you something, whether that's a product, an opinion, a service. So getting through that marketing to get to the actual information, that is evaluation. And you want to evaluate specifically the who, what, and why. What gives this particular resource, this website or this web page, authority that you can point at it and say, this is good information. I stand by this. This supports my argument. So some of the things that you need to be aware of when you look at websites, you need to look at information from experts. We have a psychological tendency to believe celebrities, and that's why there are celebrity spokespeople. But celebrities are experts at being famous. They may be an expert actor, they may be an expert singer, they are an expert marketer, but they are not necessarily an expert in medicine or relief efforts or drought. So be aware of who you're hearing when you go to various websites. 
Also be aware of the difference between advertisements and um, research or relatively objective information versus absolutely subjective information. Advertisements will hide anything that, of course, will make them look bad. So you get an uneven presentation of facts. You also get an uneven presentation of facts and perhaps even a twisted presentation of facts when you're looking at political information. And this is because, as with everything, politicians have agendas. So, for example, if you have a politician who is also a medical doctor, this can be very confusing because if they're speaking on, um, for example, abortion or vaccinations, you're, you can be a little unsure whether they're speaking as a medical doctor or as a politician presenting the stance that their political party is taking. So you have to do a little more um, digging, uh, fact-checking, check other sources, because they may well be leaving out information or presenting information from a particular perspective to support their political agenda and not the medical information that they would otherwise be an expert at. So this is a little confusing sometimes. And if you get stuck, the best way to check is to find information from a multitude of different sources. And those things that agree with one another, that's where the facts are buried. When there's complete disagreement, that's usually the opinion or bias. Which leads to the last bit, um, which is research versus, versus anecdotes. Research is done with an intent to find an answer, and very importantly, it must be replicable, which means that if an experiment, for example, is done, then it must be able to be done by other people in other places and times and have the same result. This is why scientists do research um, and do experiments over and over and over again to see if things change and also to double check each other. Because of this, experimental results that have been checked multiple times by different groups can be generalized. In other words, they can take that information and apply it to lots of different circumstances because it's been proven in different circumstances. Anecdotes are personal. They're a, an instance of this happened to me, therefore this is what the truth is. That is a personal or individual truth. It may have broader applications. You may have an experience, I may have an experience that is the same for people of my race, people of my gender um, affirmation, people of my specific sexuality, people of my age. But it is not proven across many people because it's my experience. When it is proven across many people, then it is a cultural experience. So there are differences between research, which takes the individual out of it a bit and just takes a look at whatever the question is, and anecdotes where the person is the center of that information. So evaluate your sources that you find based on what they are and how you intend to use it. If you use an anecdote, use it to illustrate or illuminate your point, but don't necessarily base your point on someone else's experience or opinion. Wikipedia is used quite often as a starting place. The only uh, recommendation that I have for Wikipedia is to um, treat it like all collaboratively created information. In other words, um, the strength of the wiki page is only as good as the least knowledgeable person who contributed to that wiki page. So always double check and back things up with several different sources. So when you start out, you start out with books. And we have both print and digital books. Um, you noticed earlier when I showed you the reserve book that it had a call number that you had to take to the front desk to ask for the book. The call number is like an address for a book. It's how we find the book on the shelf. And if it has a call number, it is in print. If it does not have a call number, it's digital. Um, currently, the library is open and reserve books and other print materials are available Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Ebooks are available 24-7 as long as the servers are up. Chat reference is also available 24-7. 
If you are looking for a textbook like that calculus book that we found earlier and the library doesn't have it, first chat with a librarian to see if we do and maybe there's a different way to get to it and we can help you with that. If we don't have it, the textbooks are not bought by the library, they come from your instructor and we ask teachers to give us textbooks but I think they listen to, t to students <laughs> more than they do to librarians. So if we don't have your textbook, ask your teacher if they will put it on reserve for you to use at the library. For anything in your research, if you can't find it, use chat. Use chat early and use it often. <laughs> because like I said earlier, you only have limited research time. So if you end up getting lost in a whole bunch of resources that don't really work for you, you're wasting that research time and you don't want to do that. Okay, so we're going to do a live book. Um, we're going to look for an ebook in the catalog, and these are the steps. Okay, um, it's very much what we did when we were looking at our reserve books, but I'm going to do something called limiting or limiters. We're going to go into format and we're going to make sure that what we get is books. We're going to make sure that they are available online. And we're going to make sure that we can get the full text of it. Okay. And that looks like this. So let me switch over to that. So for my example search, I'm going to use global warming. At the moment, there are tornadoes and ice storms in April that are tearing up half of the United States. Um, so this is a very timely topic for us. When I search that, it gives me 288,000 articles, books, and other things. And I don't necessarily want that many. So the first thing I'm going to do is head right over here. And I'm going to say, make sure that it's available online. I'm going to apply filters. That didn't cut down very many of them. So I'm going to add to that. Give me the format books. When I apply those filters, that cut out over 288,000 hits. It still gives me 715. That's probably a few too many. So I can go down here and I can say, I want this to be on the actual subject of global warming, not necessarily economics or business. I want it specifically to be about global warming. And because this is very current for me, I want the publication to be within the last 10 years. Let's say 2018. Let's make it even more narrow. You have to be careful when you're applying uh, dates to books because it takes longer for a book to be published than for an article to be published. So you won't necessarily get something that was published in 2022 for a book, but you will for an article. And that took me in basically four filters, it took me from 288,000 to 11 results. So be careful how you apply these, it could actually take you down quite a bit. So as I go through here, oh, perhaps food might be very interesting. I would click on available online and it will open up a pop-up. The first thing it does is tell me everything that I need to know for my citation. It gives me a subject that is attached to it and a short description. And then I can click on the actual article link and it will take me to the database that includes that book. Once I have it, I can't necessarily um, download the entire thing. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. It depends on the publisher. This is not something that we have control over. This particular publisher allows people to only print, email, or save 100 pages of this book. Okay, so if I go through here and I say, um, oh, let's take a look at this chapter and see what's in it. Millet. And then I can scroll through and read it. And if I see a quote that I want to take, say, I want to make this quote part of my paper. Up here, I can email the pages and it will say, what do you want? Do you just want the current page? Do you want this page and the next two pages? 
do you want this entire chapter, which is 26 pages? If I've scrolled through it, I can determine how much of it I want. So I can say, um, I just want this. I just want where the quote is. Don't send it in plain text format, because if you do, you lose any graphical information that comes with it. And you can also ask it to give you the robot's attempt at a citation that you will then want to fix before you put it in your works cited. So I will email that, and it will tell you when it has been sent. Okay. And then once I have that, I can go back to my catalog results, close this pop-up, and find another book, perhaps. Okay. So that's how you search for a topic book as opposed to a reserve book. Once you have your books and you have done some background reading, so you have a pretty solid foundation on what you want to look for and you have some ideas on search terms, then you head into periodical searching, article searching. Periodicals are anything published periodically. So a book gets published once. If it's published again, it's either a reprint or it's a new edition with different information. And that usually only happens maybe two or three or more years apart. Periodicals are published annually, semester, monthly, weekly, daily, and they fall into two general categories. Popular periodicals are things like newspapers and magazines. They are a little bit of everything for a little bit of everyone, and they are essentially centered on anything of current interest that might sell that particular publication. The stories are written by reporters who are not experts in what they are reporting. They're bringing the everyday man look to whatever that topic was um, with, hopefully, training in journalistic ethics and presentation. And these stories are intended to reach everyone. They use colloquial or everyday language, and they don't have a very high reading level. They're about middle school or so, because it is very important in a democracy for a citizenry to be informed. And not everyone has the chance to graduate high school or to go on to college. So it's very important that interesting, difficult, important, complex topics be presented in such a way in text that anyone can read them, understand them, and make informed decisions, including voting decisions, based on the information that they can get. The other bucket is academic. Um, this could be anything from journal articles to master's theses to doctoral dissertations. But they are all scholarly. They are all reviewed by other researchers in that area before they are published. They are written by subject experts and they are intended for other subject experts. So the language will be at a higher level. It will be special, specialized to that particular discipline. And the readers will be expected to understand the background without being given that background because they're not expected um, to be your general reader. They're expected to be um, a meteorologist reading about global warming, for example. <clears throat> so when you go looking in a database, just like we did for the book, you also want to use limiters for articles. You want to limit by the date and that is determined by the type of information that you're looking for, the format. You want to ensure that you click full text so that you get the actual article, not just information about the article. And you'll often want to limit by subject, like we did with global warming, so that your topic is central to that article. It isn't just mentioned here or there. Most scholarly articles include an abstract, which is a short author summary of the content. An abstract is not an annotation. An annotation is a reader's interpretation of what is important about that particular author or book. The abstract comes either from the author of the article, telling you what they think is important about it, or from professional abstractors working from the database who are also coming from an authorial position. In other words, they're looking at it as if they were the author. If full text is not automatically um, clicked, click it because you want to make sure you can actually read it. And many of these databases are indexes as well as archives, which means that they have information about the article, but they may not actually have permission to publish the entire article. Now earlier, right up at the top, I said you would want to limit by date. 
Um, that is depending on format, and that is because the type of information that you get in each is different, and the publication cycle is different. It takes longer to do the research and the peer review process for a journal article than it does to report on current news or even to do a profile in a magazine. So for journal articles, you want to search for the last five years or so, depending on your topic. If your topic is science or law, for example, or technology, something that changes pretty quickly, then you'll want to go to about the last three to five years. If your topic is one that doesn't necessarily have a lot of research on your topic, say you're looking for a specific literary work or you're looking for a specific historical issue, you might want to go back five to ten years because that may not have had a lot of scholarship done on it and you want to make sure that you get the academic research. For newspapers, because the news cycle is so quick, things happen, things update, things change, you don't want to go beyond the last three to six months maximum because if you do that, it is not a current event anymore. It is an historical perspective. So this would be really great, for example, if you wanted to find out how race was being presented in an election in the past and now and how things have changed or how they haven't changed. For that, you would get newspapers from right now. And you would also get newspapers from 1975 and from 1995 and from 2005, because newspapers are like a snapshot of the world at the moment it's happening. So you get the perspective, you get the language, you get the coverage or the lack of coverage that tells how people in the mainstream media talked about specific things at specific times. Keep in mind as well that news changes, and the news is not lying to you if a news story changes. So say, for example, there is a shooting. There was a shooting in Sacramento over this last weekend, for example. And at the time that it was originally reported, there were five people who had died, and there was one shooter suspect. A couple of days have passed, and now six people have died, and there are five arrests with possibly a sixth person who was involved in the shooting. So that first news report is now factually inaccurate, but it was accurate at the time it was reported because that was the information that was known. News changes over time, which is why you have to get the most current information to get the best information. For magazines, because they're published only about once a month usually, you can go a little longer in order to find your information. Not as long as a scholarly journal because they're popular, so they sort of expire. Um, but if you're looking for a pro profile of an entrepreneur, for example, um, <coughs> excuse me, you might want to go back the last one or two years. So here are the steps for doing research in a specific database. And I recommend when you go searching that you look at our list of databases. We have many and I'll show them to you. And you choose two or three databases that look like they would be applicable to your topic. Because while there will be some general databases, more specific databases, some databases that have one format and not another, there is very little overlap between them. So you do have to go to a few different places to do your searching, but many fewer than if you were going on to Google and having to chase websites down. From the library website, you would click on the Databases button in order to get a list of either areas, all databases, or business, or literature. And then you pick a database based on your topic and search it out. And today we're going to be using our general database, Academic Search. So here are the steps that we're going to follow for this search. We're going to head into the library, click on the databases. I'm going to show you all of our databases, and then we're going to do a search. We're going to limit it because we want academic journal articles, and I'll show you how to tell if it's academic or not academic. And then we're going to pick one and email it to ourselves. After that, I will pause the recording and I will answer questions. So that looks like this. Heading back to the library, the central button is databases. 
And when you click, <laughs> no, we don't, we don't need help, thanks. When you click on databases, notice the first is everything that we subscribe to. And all databases are subscription databases, which means that you have to be an SMC person and an enrolled student or staff member, or faculty or administrator in order to be able to use these databases. Databases that are strictly or primarily ebooks are listed here. And after that, it's broken down by disciplines. So if you're an econ class, you can go straight to business resources. If you're looking for um, literary criticism, you can go straight to literature, etc. But today, so for example, with global warming, I could go straight to science if I were interested in the meteorological aspects. If I were interested in the impact on food, I might want to look at science and social issues because food goes into things like food insecurity and poverty. If I have to go into more than one area, instead I would go into all databases so I don't have to keep bouncing back and forth to this page. And all databases gives us a list of everything that we have alphabetically by title with a short description of what is in each one. And while I'm here, I'm going to make a plug for our Library One class. We have a one unit UC and CSU transferable Library One class that explores several different databases that teaches you about the research process and the different types of formats, a bit about evaluation, and a lot about citation in the, in the MLA format. So if this looks interesting to you and you would like to dive deeper, please check out Library One. We have eight week sessions in spring and in fall, first and second eight weeks, and we have six week sessions in summer and in winter. So heading back to our databases, as you can see, we have a great number over a very wide array of topics, and most of them tend to be pretty specific. Some of them are specific to a topic, some of them are specific to a format. For example, JSTOR is all scholarly journals. One that I want to show you, though we're not going to actually search it, I'm going to point out three and search one. U.S. Newsstream is newspapers. So if you're looking for news information, you could go to LATimes.com and NewYorkTimes.com and all of the various different newspapers individually and hit paywalls and try to wade through it and find information. Or you could just go to U.S. Newsstream and do one search and search all of the major national newspapers at once and have all of the articles from 1985 or so to today's newspaper. So I highly recommend if you're needing news for your research, go into US Newsstream. And there is a video on our YouTube channel or a couple of videos on how to search this database, including one on how to do specifically major daily newspaper searches. The other one that I want to point out is we have a lot of them. Uh, I went past it, of course. It's Opposing Viewpoints. Opposing Viewpoints in Context is a good starting place for your research. If you're not really sure you have a topic and you're like, I don't even know where to start with this. If you head into Opposing Viewpoints in Context, in context there are pro and con articles and links to everything from statistics to journal articles. It's not a one-stop shop. You will want to explore more than just this one database, but it's a good place to start. JSTOR, I've already mentioned, is all scholarly journal articles, and it has a, a heavy backlist, which means if you're doing, for example, art history, this is a great place to go. Um, philosophy, um, language, various cultural studies. It's very rich in those areas. And then the one that we're going to search today, which is our most general database, and also a good place to start if you're not sure, is two databases searched together. It's Academic Search and Master File Complete. And when you search on this database, oh, by the way, with all databases, when you first go into them, if you are off campus or on your own device, you will need to log in. And it's your username, which is the name part of your SMC email address, cut it off before the at sign, and the um, password that you have chosen. So heading back, I'm on campus, so it didn't ask me to log in. Heading back to academic search, I'm going to say, give me global warming. 
And I'm not going to pick anything down here yet except full text. I want to make sure that that is clicked because I want to show you what happens when you add your limits. When you search out global warming in here, you get 39,000 articles. And some of them say periodical. Now, as you know, because we talked about it a little bit earlier, periodical simply means magazine, newspaper, anything that is popular, and also scholarly journal articles. This database doesn't use this word right. They use it to mean only popular or non-academic information. So if you see periodical, that means this is not an academic journal. If it's an academic journal, it will tell you so right here. So the first thing I'm going to do with these thousands and thousands and thousands of articles is I'm going to say I want only academic journals. That cuts it by two-thirds. Then I also want to say I want them to be peer-reviewed. Usually those two things go together so it shouldn't cut out too many, but it cut out some. Then I want to change my publication date so that it's current because this is a science technology um, rapidly changing topic. So when I do that, it cuts it down even further, but it's still too many. So I'm going to head down here and I'm going to say subject. Ooh, this one gives me two options. If I'd only gotten two results, I would go to subject thesaurus terms because thesaurus terms allow you to stay on topic and find more words that mean essentially the same thing so you'll get more results. But I have over 3,000 results. I don't need more results. I need fewer. So instead I'm going to subject all on its own. And that will cut down things considerably. Say, hmm, show more, tell me what you've got. And of these, you'll see they have all sorts of different options, fewer and fewer as you go down. I'm going to look for the ones that are actually about global warming. And that cut me down from over 3,000 to 19. So this is a very powerful limiter. But what it does do is it gets you right on topic. So if I find something that looks interesting, Ooh, this looks interesting. I can click on that title. It tells me it's an academic journal. Unlike with the books, an article, you get the entire thing when you email it to yourself. So here's all the information that you need for your citation. Here's the abstract that tells me about that article. And then here is an HTML version of this. Now it may well have information that I want in graphical format. HTML full text strips that out. So when I email it to myself, I'm going to unclick the HTML full text and I'm going to have a PDF of the article attached to my email. I would like to get a citation for this. I want the database to help me with citation and say I'm doing this for a science class. I would want APA instead of MLA, depending on what my instructor requires. I would give it my email address. Do not send it in plain text format because that will strip out all of your formatting. Everything is as I want it to be, and I send it off. And then I continue, and I can go back to my result list. I can also refine my search from here, but I'm going to go back to my result list and see if there's anything else that I want. So that is how you would do a journal search specifically for academic journals in our databases. That's that. I'm going to pause now and answer some questions, but I leave you with this thought. If you need help at any time during your research, please chat with us. We are here 24-7. Ask the librarian will connect you to someone who can help you. And that is both on the library homepage and embedded in most of our databases. Some of you may be looking at this website or at this workshop, sorry, for extra credit. And there is a code word for that. The code word is Wayfinder because the research process helps you find your way to the answers that you seek. 
Thank you for coming for this workshop, and I will now close it so that I can take questions. Be well.